hear it with your ears? Can you see it with your eyes? Can you feel it wiggling between your quivering thighs? That thing. Boom, 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 boom with James. Boom, 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 boom. Once every millennium, something will come along. When you feel it, you will know it, cause it's coming on strong. That thing. Boom, 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 boom with James. Boom, 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 boom. Sit back, relax, deep breaths, no stress. Let me come inside your mind. I promise you it won't take long. The change will happen soon. You will feel something so special growing deep within you. That thing. Boom, 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 that thing. Boom, 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 that thing. Boom, 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 with James. That's me. Welcome to episode 65 of That Thing with James J. Asher II. I'm your host, James J. Asher II. That's me. And today we are talking about writing, the process of writing, and why it's good and fun and good for you. But let's start off with a little short story that I wrote. Now, if you've been following this show for a hot minute already... You may know that uh, if you become a Patreon subscriber, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm doing that right now. If you become a Patreon subscriber, you will get access to the uh, once every two weeks very short stories that I write um, exclusively for the donors. Uh, To my two donors and one previous donor, thank you so much for your contributions. And for all the rest of you, if you want to become a donor, it only takes a dollar if you have a dollar to spare. And if you do, then you will get access to fun stories, original stories that I write, such as the one I am about to read right now. This story is entitled Neurotica. Yes, Neurotica like erotica and neurotic, neurotica. The sun was down and the moon was new. Lamplight, chopped by wooden Venetian blinds, poured out of the living room's windows, casting warm stripes upon the tall privacy bushes growing just two feet from the house's vinyl shell. But it wasn't enough light to reveal me. A tall, handsome woman paced back and forth in silence behind her glass-topped coffee table, from the love seat to the couch to the recliner, then from the recliner to the couch to the love seat, again and again, biting her fingernails. Her name was Diana. There was a knock at the door. Diana stopped in her tracks, body frozen, breath held tight, eyes wide. She opened the door. A short, round, balding, bespectacled man stood there clutching a bouquet of roses in his left hand. His mouth opened, but no sound came out. Diana said, Hi. The man, now able to speak, also said, Hi. But his greeting was muffled by a sharp blast of gas that escaped his ass. I almost came right then and there, and in my near ecstasy, I lost my balance. See, my pants were around my ankles, so I tripped a bit, leaned too far back, and got stabbed by the sharp leaves of the shrubbery. There was a rustling at my feet. Garfield, my obese Persian house cat, must have slipped outside when I did. I looked through the window to see if Diana or her ugly man had noticed me. They had not. They were both seated now, Diana on the love seat, the man on the recliner. Their eyes were on everything but each other. The short, round, balding, bespectacled man pointed toward a framed picture on the mantel above the sleeping fireplace. There was a picture of Diana standing with an older man with silver hair. The short man said, Who's the man? Diana said, 
Oh, that's daddy. The short man replied, Huh. Silence. Oh, the silence made me swell. I could feel the tension in that living room. Diana crossed her legs so that they were pointing toward the bald man. She said, So, this is our third date. The man, who still hadn't looked Diana in the eye, not even once, cleared his throat, patted his knee, and said, <clears throat> Yep, third. Silence. Diana cleared her throat, dragged her fingertips lightly across her collarbone, and said, I usually put out on the third date. The man replied, Yep, third. Diana rubbed the pale band of skin on her left ring finger, glanced toward the window I hid behind, and invited her portly suitor to join her on the love seat. He shifted in the recliner, but rather than rise, he asked, Do you have any water? I'm kind of thirsty. Diana said yes, left the room for a minute, then returned with a freshly opened bottle of Prosecco and two crystal flutes. She filled one and handed it to the balding man, but he declined. Oh, no, thank you. I don't drink. Water will, be, water, water will be fine, please. Diana said, oh, I'm sorry, and emptied the flute in one gulp, then refilled it. She didn't offer to fetch water for the man, nor did he offer to get it himself. He just sat there, slowly turning red, dew forming on his forehead. Minutes progressed, but their conversation didn't. Diana patiently waited for the man to say something, but he gave up on every half-spoken phrase that escaped his lips. He stammered and shook his head, betraying each internal self-criticism, unconsciously rubbing his bulbous belly and shifting in his seat again and again. This date had clearly given the man terrible gas. His body appeared to be stiff and achy. I was stiff too. The smoothness of my wedding band played upon the bottom of my shaft, and it only made me stiffer. It, it had been only five minutes, but Diana had already drunk half of the bottle. She let a strap of her dress fall, nearly revealing her entire right breast. She flirted with the fat, balding, ugly, bespectacled date, her language more lewd with every quip. Again and again she invited him to join her on the love seat. But again and again, the man rem remained in the recliner, unable to look at Diana for more than a split second. Diana seemed to have had enough of his timidity because she rose from the love seat and placed herself on the man's lap. She tossed her legs over one arm of the recliner and placed one arm behind the man's head. With her free hand, she stroked the man's cheek and uttered things I couldn't hear. The man became so flushed that even his head glowed red beneath his wispy brown comb-over. My balls tightened. And I was so drawn to the man's awkwardness that I barely noticed the rustling at my feet. Diana drew close to the man and said aloud, Kiss me. Kiss me right now. I want you to kiss me. He was so tense that he couldn't even turn his head more than an inch. So, for the first time that evening, he turned his eyes to meet Diana's. He opened his mouth ever so slightly, struggling to say something, but his body spoke for him. It let loose a deep, loud, bone-rattling fart. And he said, I need to go home. Golden, vibrating electricity shot from my fingers, my toes, my scalp, inward, converging in my loins. My balls tightened even more, and my member throbbed as I recoiled, shooting powerful load after powerful load of hot jism. I saw stars. When my vision and my breath had returned, I looked back into the living room. Diana was alone. Her fingers had disappeared between her thighs, but they soon produced a wet golden ring, which she slipped onto her left ring finger. She approached the window I hid behind, raised the blinds and opened the window. She leaned out of it, grinning, and asked, How is that, Daddy? I was about to reply, but was distracted by a purring sound. I looked down and saw the obese Persian cat at my feet. It looked wet and sticky. I looked back at Diana and said, I came on Garfield. Diana placed her hand on her hip and chuckled. <laughs> Garfield! The end. 
Now, if you want more great original stories like these, you can get access to them if you become a subscriber to my Patreon at patreon.com slash that thing with James. If you want to become a donor, you can donate as little as a dollar a month if you are able to. If not, that's okay. But don't let these stories pass you by. Become a donor today at patreon.com slash that thing with James. Uh, okay, that's enough whoring myself out. Let's talk about writing. I've been writing for a long time. I don't even remember when I started writing. I've been writing as far back as I can remember. I've always had a very active imagination. Um, even before I was writing words down on a page, I was still writing like with, uh, with my toys. I had like Star Wars uh, action figures or dolls, whatever you want to call them, but they were from Star Wars. And I would, and I had G.I. Joe toys and I would play out scenes um, like I, I would take stuff I'd seen from movies or TV shows and I'd make my own stories with the, with the toys. And they were usually very uh, brutal and gory and violent stories. And, um, you know, I would like use a red marker and draw blood on the toys. I'd start a fire and just hold them over it, not to melt them, but to make them all sooty, covered in soot so that they looked like they had been in combat. I would rub them in dirt and stuff like that. Um, but I would not destroy the toys. I just wanted them to look like they'd seen some shit, uh, but without torturing them. You know, I'm not that um, sadistic kid Sid from Toy Story. No, um, I, I loved my toys and I loved um, casting them in the stories that I would make up. Well, you know, come, so, you know, and I read a lot too. Um, read a lot of like Hardy Boys and Treasure Island, and I read a lot. My parents made sure I read, um, and I'm grateful for that. And I still read, which I am also grateful for. Um, <clears throat> well, what was I going to say? I've been writing for a long ass time, so I I guess some of the earliest times I like wrote something out on page was for school assignments. Um, that gave me a creative outlet, and it just seems to be a an impulse of mine. I can't not um, express myself. I can't not put down in writing stories that come to my head. And it's not like I sit around just drafting these things out and working outlines as a boring fucking hobby all the time. It's just how my brain works. I think up a scenario or something funny uh, or, or, or something not so funny, just characters or some type of insight. And the way it works in my mind is that it fits in some kind of narrative structure. And... Um, and so I, I, I write the things down and, you know, I will journal and I for personal things in my life. But even if I'm journaling about personal things in my life, there's still a sort of narrative structure to it, unless I'm just total word vomiting a bunch of stuff that I might be worried or stressed about. Um, but, yeah, I've been writing for a long time and I, I used to draw a lot, too when I was younger, I, I guess I kind of fell out of it, um, in college because I just got caught up with other things and the writing or the drawing kind of fell off, but I would like to get back to drawing eventually. But, um, um, it hasn't like naturally come back to me yet, but when I was, I was drawing a lot in like junior high and high school and I'd make little like kind of storyboards for scenes a little like, uh, you know, crime action stories I'd play out in my head, like a bank heist or something. And I would draw very poorly the, uh, just like the comic strips, um, 
and uh, I, I later would find out that's what they do for movies. It's just it's called storyboarding. You've got your script, um, and then you hire an artist to draw visuals to help aid um, and uh, envision what you want to create and film when making a movie or a TV show. Um, well, I, I guess I was doing that kind of stuff. Um, but writing has always been, it's a creative outlet, but it's also a therapeutic outlet for me as well. Um, so I started writing poems, I guess in high school when I really, really started getting, um, depressed and, um, kind of existentially, um, unsettled. And, um, I started, you know, through reading and everything, um, I was able to articulate and call upon, uh, the, vocabulary that I had, um, uh, gathered together over time through talking with other people and through reading things, um, from school and my personal life and so on. And one of the easiest ways for me to express myself and one of the most natural feeling ways was through writing poems. And more often than not, the poems weren't just poems, but were songs. I would write out lyrics. So especially by the time I was 17, because that's when I started playing guitar, I wanted to make songs. I didn't just want to be a fucking cover band. Like this is, I've got all this energy in me and I need to get it out. And making music um, is one of the most natural ways for me to do it, as is simply writing things out. Um, and that's good and all, but, uh, today I want to focus just sort of on the writing process, things I've read and things I've discovered on my own. Um, so I'm sure I'll talk about my personal history with writing as we go along, but, um, for all intents and purposes, I'm going to try to focus on the process, on the craft in this episode. Um, I'm, it's pretty fucking warm in here, so I'm going to take a short water break. I'll be right back. And I'm back. I want to start with um, an excerpt from something else that I wrote. I will tell you about it after I read this excerpt, but I really, I've always really liked this bit that I wrote here. <clears throat> it goes like this. At the time of my visit, this particular neighborhood was up and coming. That's a nice way of saying it was, developmentally, somewhere between a low-income Latin ghetto and gentrified yuppie hell. Artisanal, locally sourced, cruelty-free, fair trade, recycle-friendly kombucha shops selling single-wrapped, tea tree oil-infused toothpicks for dogs at $5 a piece popped up in long-defunct lots that had been flattened for the quick construction of cube-shaped condominiums paid to park spots and ground floor phenomena like Ohm Power TM yoga studios manifesting within the world of, gentr of the gentrification camp campaign, which outpriced the culturally unique and authentic families, longtime residents whose Catholic memories were to be sacrificed in the name of the new gods, sterile, safer, and profitable. That is an excerpt from a book that I wrote. I'm sure I've mentioned it on here before, but I wrote a book. Um, I started it, the, that particular book, I think, I think when I was maybe 28 uh, was when I like went in for the first really rough draft of it um, and it was incomplete. But um, yeah, I have a book. Um, it's still certainly not published. Um, I would like to at least really try pursuing the traditional publishing route. Um, but um, I put a lot into this book and I'm very proud of the work that I did. Um, now I, 
<laughs> my my biggest challenge as a writer uh, is paring down the words, making it less wordy, really utilizing my economy of words. And that means saying a lot with as few words as possible. Um, and uh, so I'm still doing that, just taking out excessive that's and ands and so's and stuff like that. Um, but for the story itself, really, and the language of it, really, it's done. It's done. Um, I just got to take out some little excess stuff to try to pare down the word count. Because last year I did pursue publishing a little bit, but um, my word count was still a bit on the heavy side, um, considering what kind of novel it is. And also considering the fact that I'm in no name, unknown, unestablished writer. So, um, trying to get the word count down, but essentially the book is fucking done and I'm very, very, very proud of it. And I learned so much from writing it. Um, it's kind of, uh, sort of a memoir about, um, I mean, it, it jumps around in my life. It's definitely based off of my life. Um, but the main focus is on a good, like, five to seven years of my life um, as a sort of uh, 30th birthday gift to myself. So I mentioned before I'd always been writing. Um, and on my... 27th birthday, I decided, um, I'm really gonna, you know, instead of just doing little short, like short, very short stories in my notebooks that no one's going to see, uh, why don't I try writing short stories and sending them into contests and into, um, literary magazines and stuff like that to see if anything came of it. Nothing came of it, but I didn't, I didn't really commit to it. I mean, I was committing to it for a good few months. Um, but after those few months, I decided on my, uh, on my 27th birthday, actually, I decided I am going to write a book. I don't know what the book is going to be, but I want to write a full book because who knows my life philosophy, I might die at any second, in any number of ways. It's a miracle that I'm alive right now. But uh, at the time, I was like, I don't feel complete right now. I feel like I've accomplished some things, but it's not the things that um, I feel like greatly proud of. And I would feel greatly proud of myself if I were to work on a book and write um, just a complete full beginning to end a complete project. And so I started writing and I've had lots of false starts for a couple months. Um, I was playing around with different stories that essentially I was stealing from other stories that I liked and making my own version of it of like, you know, like The Matrix or Alice in Wonderland or something like that. Just basically a character living a humdrum life um, meets an, an unlikely, uh, makes an unlikely alliance with uh, some people that turn his world upside down, but for the better, makes him truly feel alive. But really, I was just writing out my fantasy of what I wanted for my life at that time. I felt very stuck um, and without purpose and without meaning and not, I felt like I was alive, but not really living. I felt I was merely existing uh, never mind that I was struggling rather than thriving. Um, that aside, as far as the um, quality of me feeling truly alive, I didn't feel truly alive. 
So I was just kind of writing out a fantasy of mine, hoping that maybe through the magic of my writing, something similar might actually happen in my life. Um, and it just kept being a non-starter because um, it was not real. I mean, of course, it was a fiction, but um, it wasn't the story that I really wanted to tell. And I didn't realize it. It took me several false starts to realize that that was not the story I needed to tell. And if you uh, so desire to write something, I highly encourage you to fail as much as possible. Don't be afraid of false starts, uh, non-starters. Don't be afraid of failure. Fail and fail and fail. I can tell you, um, I, I'm going to elaborate on it, but I did not stop writing. I kept writing and writing and writing. I committed to it. And through that habit, through that practice, I learned so fucking much um, about the craft of writing, about language itself, about stories, um, how they're presented, how, how to present a story, how I take in a story, how to dissect stories that I, that come to me, be they written, uh, heard or, or seen and heard and maybe read. Um, I learned about grammar, dude, I, I fucking learned so much about English language, grammar, uh, mechanics, usage, all that stuff. I learned about that as I went along. Um, I would uh, misspell some. When you're writing, especially if you're doing creative writing, don't worry so much about spelling because if you get um, caught up in the um, minutia of is this word spelled right on like a first draft, you're not going to get anywhere and you're going to drag yourself down. Just let it be, and then that's what rewriting is for, is to clean up later and look at, oh, wait, oh, there's that word that I wasn't sure about. Let me look it up now. If you're doing a first draft, just get it out um, by whatever means possible. Don't worry about good grammar. Uh, don't worry about mechanics and usage and spelling and all that stuff. Just get it out, and it will look like shit. And it will be a mess. It will be too wordy, most likely. Um, and, and the things that need to be expanded and elaborated on probably won't be. Uh, but you won't know that until you go back and review it after having written it. So if you're going to write a first draft, just fucking get it out. And don't worry about the mistakes. Because, and here's one of the greatest fucking things I love about writing, is that... You aren't doing it for a fucking grade. If you're doing creative writing, of, of fear out of fear out of your own volition, um, for your own self edification, um, you're not turning the fucking thing in. Certainly not anytime soon. Um, especially if you're a no name, it's not like you have a deadline or anything. Um, so on a first draft, just get it out. And let it be shit. Get the words out. Because then you have something to go back and fix. Because if you don't just get it out and let mistakes happen and let it look like shit and let it look like, did a fucking first grader write this? If you don't have that in the first place, then you have nothing to rewrite. You have nothing to go back and fix. You have no foundation upon which to build. Now, an outline is not a foundation. Oh yeah. For those of you type A personalities who need outlines and plans and stuff like that, when it comes to drafting a story, an outline is not a fucking draft. 
Now, it may be sort of like a little cheat sheet to help you guide you on your way. Um, it may give you, uh, no, I'm not saying that um, outlines are unnecessary and I'm not saying they're not useful. They most certainly are useful, um, especially if uh, you're the type of person that needs them. I usually don't do much outlining. And even if I do have an outline, I usually end up diverging from the outline because in the process of writing, of actually writing it out, instead of just outlining, but actually writing the thing, in that process, I will most of the time find something better than what I had initially outlined. Um, now, if there are certain details of like, I have to get this timing right and all that stuff, it may help to have an outline. But for me personally, that's one of those things I learned um, through making things more difficult for myself than necessary. Um, in my book, there it, it jumps around in time a little bit, and I feel like it may, I may have saved myself a month or two of work, maybe more, um, a very tedious, frustrating, headache inducing work. Um, if I had written out like a timeline, but that's simply because my story was based on my actual life, um, real events. Granted, I've changed names. I changed a specific few details. I mean, really, it's it's just a fucking nonfiction. I just like changed some names, changed features and some details. But as far as like the events themselves, they actually happened. Um, oh, so getting to how I came to write that book in that specific story, how I came to write about some things that actually, well, some, a lot of things that actually happened to me. So as I mentioned before, I was, uh, initially, uh, when I turned 27, I was like, I'm not Kurt Cobain right now. I'm not famous. I had hoped, uh, by the time I left college, I had hoped that, I would be on my way to being f famous or at least just living comfortably solely off of um, artistic work, be it writing, music, or acting, or whatever. Um, and I still want that, but um, I'm learning patience. Um, the older I get, I find I'm better at accepting um, my present circumstances, my present reality. And, but through that, through that acceptance, I am better able to find my way toward getting where I want to be uh, or doing what I want to do, as opposed to just sitting around and wishing things were just different, you know, magically, poof, I'm going to write this story about this guy's life who just magically turns um, exciting. And then maybe that'll happen for me. And no, no, it's a, it's a journey. You've heard it a million times. I'm sure it's a journey. Life is a journey. And in order to get from A to B, you got to travel. You're not, you're not going to teleport to someplace. No, maybe some freak thing will happen. You'll get further along or further away from where you initially set as your point B, point A being where you are right here, right now. Um, but the older I'm getting, the better I am at accepting my, my circumstances, my reality, my limitations. And through that, recognizing what I have available to me right now. Because if I, I mean, dreaming is good. I dream a lot. Um, I, I can't not dream. It's a uh, compulsive thing. It's in my nature to dream of things. Uh, but I'm also getting better at just being awake as well. Um, 
anyway, so I, I was working on this story, uh, and then I was like, okay, okay, fuck that. Maybe if I just scrap that story, I'm going to write a story about sort of uh, how I think, how I feel um, existence would be better. So I started working on this story that I titled The Way of Life. And around that time, I was learning a lot about like Wu Wei, Taoism, stuff like that, as I covered a few episodes back. And also uh, the uh, Japanese aesthetic um, art and slash philosophy called um, Wabi Sabi which is uh, finding beauty in imperfections uh, and accepting that everything is transient and will always be incomplete and that it's mere transience and incompleteness and imperfection is what makes it perfectly beautiful. It's a paradox, but there's beauty in it. Um... So I started working on this story called The Way of Life, and I soon found out that's not what I really want to work on either, because I, I, I set a goal for myself like, okay, I'm going to sit at my desk uh, at my laptop and write for an hour, five days a week. And I did that. I did that five days a week, and it ended up being more like seven days a week because I found that on the days that I didn't write, I didn't feel so well because I was discovering as I committed to it, even if I didn't feel like writing for a day, I was committing to sitting down and writing, to getting my ass in the chair uh, for an hour, and I would write for an hour, and I'd set a timer, and I would write, and if before that hour was up, I felt like I couldn't write anymore. I just kept writing. Um, and it may have just been, I don't want to be writing right now. I'm wasting my fucking time. La, 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 la. If you feel, I, I don't really believe in writer's block. Um, writer's block is just self-block. Uh, just shift your perspective a little bit. Open your mind a little bit. Um and allow yourself to write something else that might be completely chan tangential, tangential, something completely non sequitur. If it has nothing to do with what you're writing about, if you feel like you're slowing down and it's like, I don't know what the fuck to do right now, just write that like a thousand times on the page. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm writing about. I don't know what this is. This is all trash. Just write and just do um, basically stream of consciousness. And more often than not, like 99% of the time, if you do that, you will get back on track um, from where you slowed down initially. Um, but I found through that practice of writing, oh, and if the hour came, um, I made a rule to myself. This was all just for me, what worked for me. Um, if the hour came up, I would stop. Now, if it was a thought that I needed to complete, um, I would complete the thought. Like, it's just like complete a sentence or a short paragraph or something. And uh, as a way of giving myself a cue of where to pick up the next time I return tomorrow uh, for my next hour-long writing session. And through those writing sessions, I found that I felt like I had purpose. I felt catharsis. I felt like I was doing what I was meant to do. Now, I'm not going to say that writing will make everyone feel that way. But the I, I found that out for myself, that I feel complete. And I feel truly in my element when writing creatively. And um, but I would not have discovered that had I not committed to a practice of writing. Um, I, I, I stumbled upon that reality, that realization by accident. Um, but after a while, I figured out the way of life. It 
was a non-starter as well. And that I needed to write about some, some ghosts that were haunting me. And I will elaborate on that after this short break. Be right back. And I'm back. Let's wrap this puppy up, but let me begin with one more excerpt from my book. Uh, I haven't read this one in a while, so here's this. I said, sometimes there is no solution to a dilemma. No immediate solution, at least. Sometimes a situation just needs to work itself out. Actually, most times situations just need to work themselves out. That's how it works for me. The harder I search for a solution, the harder it is to find. And the more I try to force a certain solution, a certain outcome, the more out of control the situation becomes. It just blows up in my face. So I say, the best solution for you right now is to accept that there is no solution right now. Communicate your thoughts and feelings to him, but... Also, accept that the situation is largely out of your control. Accept that you can't control his feelings. Don't beat yourself up over it. Just relax and watch cartoons with me. End excerpt. Uh, Just before I got back from my break, I was thinking about um, what to write and why to write. Um as far as what to write, you're, the why is different for everybody. The what is different for everybody. But as far as the um, intention behind it is concerned, um, I, I've i heard this from other people. Um, I mean, I've as I went along writing, I also um, sought out advice from other writers, be it people I knew and people I didn't know. Um, one really, really, really good book is, um, on writing by Stephen King. It's a great fucking book. Uh, the first half of it is sort of an auto actually is an autobiography. And then the second half of the book is basically his approach and his advice on writing itself. It's his own advice and a lot of his own advice was advice that he got from other people and, and just things he discovered along the way. And um, it's interesting that the first half is his autobiography and then the second half is functionally uh, writing advice. And um, it works out very well. Um, I guess it's... I didn't even think of it. It's kind of like this. I started off with a little bit of a autobiography of like my experience with getting into writing and then getting into writing itself, uh, in this episode. Um, so if you're going to write something, don't write, uh, write for yourself, write something that you would like to read, write the thing you want to read not what you think other people want, not what you think is popular, not what you think will make you famous, not what you think will make people like you, not what you think will make you look smart or cool or artsy fartsy, whatever. Fuck all that stuff. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it straight off a cliff. Write for yourself. Write for yourself Write for yourself. Write what you, you, specifically you, in your deepest heart of hearts, write what you want to read. The story you want to read. Something you haven't seen yet. Write it. It doesn't exist yet because you are meant to be the one who brings it into existence. And, um, and then from there on out, you can't control if people are going to like it or not, but I do believe you have some control over how well done it is. 
And that's where you get into more technical stuff like um, Anne Rice has a rule for writing. Um, Anne Rice only has one rule for writing, and that is there are no rules. And I agree the that's one of the brilliant fucking things. Of course, if you're going to be writing in a certain language, let's use English because that's my primary language, my, my mainly only language. Learn the rules, master the rules of grammar, usage and mechanics and then and, and 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 understand story structure and things like that have a very solid grasp on those things first and foremost and then you can break those rules but you must have a firm grasp you must be able to understand and handle and wield those rules before you will be able to fuck around with them. I mean, you can fuck around with the stuff, but it usually does not turn out uh, very well. Um, it just kind of looks a mess and doesn't make sense. I'm sure you've seen lots of movies where it's like, wow, that was a fucking mess. That was very poorly executed. Usually that happens because the person who did that was trying to play around with some rules that they did not understand well enough yet. Furthermore, that person or persons making that film or that book or whatever, maybe they were doing it for the wrong intentions. Maybe they were doing it because they wanted to make money. Maybe they were doing it because it's the popular hot thing right now, because they think it's what would sell, because they think it's what will uh, net them an Oscar. Fuck all that. Or, or, or Pulitzer or whatever. Fuck all that stuff. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it right off a cliff. Right for you and no one else. However, when you are writing, uh, when you have a voice, um, Kurt Vonnegut's advice for that is to write as if you are writing to you're writing for yourself, but when you're writing it, approach it like you're writing to one person. You're not writing it for a whole faceless blob of the mass of people you hope will get into this. Like, I'm going to write a steampunk for all the neckbeards out there. No, write it for someone specific. Write it for someone you know, because then it's more personal then you're better able to access the the language that you are going to need and you're uh, you have a it just kind of um unconsciously helps you get a grasp on how to communicate clearly um without going overboard and without seeming mechanical or or too general it adds a certain uh, soul to it a certain uh perspective to it. it 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 adds you because it's you writing it and if you're writing it to one specific person that you know um then there's a bit of there's love there there's love in it even if it's uh you know writing about all the hate in the world if you're writing it for to someone as if i mean that person doesn't have to read it um, you might hope that they never set eyes on it. Um, but as far as the process of the writing itself, the exercise itself, write as if you're writing to one person and it's just a general rule to help keep you on point. Um, what else? One thing I like, um, I got this from Stephen King's on writing and he got this also from a lot of other, uh, some other crime writers. Um, the name escapes me. Um, take out all the stuff. Oh, what's that one crime writer? He says like, um, write your first draft and then take out all the stuff. People tend, tend to skip over. <laughs> um, don't use, adverbs so basically he swiftly blah 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 
show. Don't tell show. Um, it's boring if you say he opened the door swiftly or whatever. And it, it, if it's a challenge um, to take out adverbs, I hope I'm using the right word adverbs to take out like L Y verbs, adjective verbs, adverbs, um, to take those out is to give yourself a challenge because you want to express that someone, uh, Kramer, Cosmo Kramer opened the door swiftly. So how would you say, instead of saying swiftly, you could say, um, Cosmo Kramer burst into the room and the door slammed against the wall, the back wall, and knocked a picture that was hanging on that wall. Something like that. It it forces you to uh, paint the picture a little more, and it also shows rather than tells. It shows and, yeah, helps paint the picture a little more, adds some more uh, vividness to... The world you're building. And and again, use an economy of words. Try to find how the best way to say something uh, with the fewest words possible. Because people get it. A lot of um, reading, when you're reading, uh, the reader is the one that completes the story. You can take a very short three-word sentence, but your imagination, the reader's imagination, adds all sorts of color to it off of in their head what they're envisioning these characters look like and all that stuff. And you can add little details if you want. You can add or subtract as many details as you need. I know one of my problems, as I mentioned before, is just um, getting uh, language economy, using fewer words. But I don't know how to do that until I've written too many words until I've said something with too many words and it comes out kind of muddled sounding. Um, some more advice from me personally, what I like to do with my own writing is, um, always like for every line I aim for every line to drive the momentum of the story forward. Um, if I come across a line that seems like dead weight, that seems like it's not driving the story inch by inch further along, um, then I need to either rewrite it or take it out altogether. Maybe it's just excessive, unnecessary. Um, but usually it's something that I was trying to say that I, with a, a little work, a patience and imagination, um, I'm able to rephrase it or maybe work the sentences uh, sa it's sandwiched between so that whatever I was trying to communicate with that overly wordy sentence um, is communicated just inherently through the other things I wrote with fewer words. Um, what else? Mm, always drive the story forward with every, every line, drive the story forward. Uh, that's my thing because I don't, when I, I, I like to read things that drive things forward. I don't like to read things that are just like, well, this isn't, this is just kind of beating a dead horse. I know what the fucking room looks like. You don't need to paint it unless it serves the narrative in some way. Uh, as, unless like if you're, if, if the story is told from a character's, uh, first person, um, limited perspective, then maybe that person is describing every inch of the brick. Well, are you just telling the reader, uh, an excess number of details because you want them to see specifically what you envision of the brick, or are you trying to communicate the certain way that the narrator, that character thinks and functions? Ask yourself that if you get into stuff like that, ask yourself how these characters function, how they perceive and that sort of stuff. But all in all, um, if you're going to write, just 
get your ass in the chair. That's it. Just sit your ass in the chair and start writing. And if you can't think of anything, just start doing stream of conscious because then you're at least exercising your fingers and your mind. You're bringing them into action. Um, Yeah, just do stream of conscious if you can't think of anything else because then at least you're getting words out of your head into the material realm. And that will kind of get the ball rolling and get you a few steps closer to writing what you want to write or, or, or better yet, what you need to write. Um, the, the book I wrote, I needed to write it because I had a lot of things in my past that I, um, that I, that I did not have any closure on that I needed to find closure on that I needed, uh, to understand further. That's why I was writing about things in in my personal life and putting them in a fictional context (laughs) with very thin veneer, but still fictional context that created, um, by, by taking my personal life and saying, okay, I'm making this a fiction. I'm giving these people, they're going to look a little different. Uh, the names of these places are going to be different, but the events and the actions and the character and the attitudes are all real. They're all based off of my life, but I'm turning it into a fiction, even if it's just a slight turn. That gave me the distance I needed from the events of my life, uh, be they current at the time or things from the past that I needed to further better understand. Um, That little bit of distance um, helped me get perspective. And that's why I wrote the book, because I I needed perspective. And through writing, even if it's creative writing, you, something of you, even if you're writing something completely fantastical or science fiction, about nothing, nothing about you, if you set out with that, if you're really writing for you, you will appear on the page. Um, you can write about shit you don't know about, but it's total fiction. But you will still appear on the page. You are in every line and squiggle and curve and dot. You are in that story. And um, whether you mean to or not, you and your experience, your hopes, your fears, uh, the things you need to understand, the things you want to understand better, those things appear on the page. And that's a good thing because it helps you uh, get a more whole and complete picture of you, of your life, of your experience. You get a better understanding of yourself and your experience. And through that, you become a better writer. Uh, You gain depth of character. um, And you'll become, I believe, a better person in general for having further understood yourself gives you the ability to further understand others. Um, and it expands your awareness and, and it deepens the depth of your vision of life in general. Um, that's honestly all I can think of. If you want to write, sit down and write, period. That's it. My recommendation from the very beginning, uh, once every single day, seven days a week, if you're just starting, set a timer for five minutes and just write. And if you don't know what to write about, just do stream of conscious, whatever comes off your head, no matter how nonsensical, it doesn't even have to be words. But as long as you're taking um, nonsense, noise words, onomatopoeia from your head and putting it onto a page, taking it from uh, the immaterial realm and manifesting it into material space as writing, then you have written and you have created, I believe, the ultimate magic. 
you took something out of your imagination and brought it into the real world. And if it's something that's bothering you, that's on your mind, I encourage you even more. I encourage you so much to write about these things because it takes that stuff, that, that, that pain, that uh, in, impalpable internal formless pain that you can't put a finger on, it extracts it from you and puts it on a page. It creates some distance and makes it material so you can touch it and get a better view of it. All right? So if you want to write, I suggest start with five minutes and write. Don't write for less than the five minutes and don't go over. Just write for five minutes. But if you if you do end up going over, good for you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I love you all so much. And I hope this episode gave you some insight or uh, offers some value to you. Um, Because I love you. I want to learn from you, and I hope you learn from me. And I hope we can all learn from each other. Okay. See you next week. Bye-bye.